fascinating statement here it says as he was going on his way the angels of God met him angels of God met him what an amazing thing that sometimes God sends angels interferes in the natural life with the supernatural it's an amazing thing and God does that for one specific purpose especially when we are about to face a big crisis a very big crisis and he knows we do not have it within us to face that crisis God sends supernatural aid supernatural work God will do it in such a way that it is undoubtedly the act of God, the work of God. There is no shadow of doubt. That is how definitive it would be when God does supernatural works in our midst. That's why Jacob, when he saw that, he says, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Mahanaim means two camps. He saw his own camp and the camp of the angels surrounding him as a, in a circle. We have that and, uh, enlightened to us in Psalm 34, verse 7. It's a beautiful psalm, beautiful verse. Psalm 34, verse 7, it says. It's, it's, it's a memory verse for some of us. Some of us have memorized it. It says in Psalm 34, verse 7, The angel of the Lord encamps around, round about them that fear him and delivers them around, surrounding. You know, the supernatural work that God does, sending angels to help in the moments of crisis, we have uh, seen that several times uh, we saw how Elisha cried to God, asked God to open the eyes of his servant. And he opened and he saw chariots of fire surrounding Elisha and his servant. Also Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane when he prayed, let us go there in uh, Luke uh, chapter 24 I'm oh sorry Luke uh, chapter 22 verse 41 onwards let me read Luke chapter 22 verses 41 let me read he says and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast this is Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane and kneeled down and prayed saying father if thou be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. An angel appeared from heaven, strengthening him. Well, it is not as if God, the Son, Jesus, does not have strength. But this is a mystery. He also talks about, not my will, but thine be done. And in God's will and Jesus' will, the same. There is a mystery here. It talks about the complex details 
about the diverse natures, the two natures that Jesus has upon the earth. On this side of heaven, this mystery cannot be understood. Some people call it hypostatic union, you know, to describe this phenomena. They just gave it a name. They could not explain it. They called it hypostatic union. They couldn't go past it because there is a barrier, mental block. We cannot go past that mystery. But here we see a supernatural act, angels coming and strengthening. You know, in Psalm 91 also we have that, He gives His angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Psalm 91, is it verse 11? Verse 11. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Verse 12. God gives his angels charge over us. There's a book written by Billy Graham called Angels. Angels. Billy Graham wrote a book. Beautiful book. There are many interesting stories in there. Now, a lot of those uh, stories are unmistakably true stories because of the, the mark they left behind in the lives of those people you have to say and look at it and say this is nothing but the hand of God you know God leaves that mark the mark of God's stamp and you cannot question it and say no 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 you you went through a, a psychological a phenomenon you were going through some hallucinations you know psychological games you know when you're really tired you probably go through some mental gymnastics it's not real you know say Satan can come and tell us that question the validity of our faith but God sometimes puts the mark and so unmistakable you can with your own eyes and see then say with the definitive certainty nothing but the hand of God there was this missionary John G Payton John G Payton a Scottish missionary, he went to this island called the Hebrides Islands. He worked there among the people who were uncivilized, meaning they were cannibals. He, God gave him the call. This Hebrides, Hebrides Islands were north of New Zealand, very close to Australia. You know, when he went there, he dared his life to go and preach the gospel to those cannibals. They let him stay there, and he tried to preach the gospel to them. And uh, he tried to train them with the basic uh, civilization, you know, building tools, uh, being able to do things more intelligently. He was training some, but during the his stay, something happened. You know, this mis this miscommunication or misunderstanding. The chief got enraged, and he gave the ultimatum. Tonight we're coming to your house. We're going to burn your house down and kill you. It was unmistakable. It wasn't as if he misunderstood the language. It was very clear. The angry faces, the, everything was very clear. So that night, he and his wife, only two of them, together, knelt down and prayed all night. Waiting for that shouting and the, you know, the burning torches to come. Uh, near the home nothing happened everything was quiet not a sound nothing happened all night next morning they got up everything was normal they didn't un understand what was going on life was continuing normally in about a year the chief confessed his faith in Christ he became a Christian and with him, the rest of the people became Christians. John Payton got an opportunity to talk to the chief after he, he was able to gain his confidence. He asked him, you threatened to kill my whole family, my whole house about a year ago. Why did you not do it? And he was shocked that John Payton asked that question. Surprise in his eyes, he said, why? You put such a big army in front of your house. I said, what? Yes, we saw this strong, gigantic people 
hundreds of them, very powerful people with uh, shining clothes and long swords circling your house all night. We waited and waited and we got too scared when we ran away that night. You see, angels surrounding that family. John G. Payton, he also documented this event in his own autobiography. John G. Payton, P-A-T-O-N. If you take the time to read that book, you would see so many wonderful works of God in his life. How the sacrifices that he made, how he buried his own wife and his own son, and he sat on the burial ground, slept on the burial ground to make sure those cannibals did not dig the grave to take away those bodies. So much, so much sacrifice he made to win the whole island to Christ. Fascinating stories you would see in John Payton's life. Angels sent to help us. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6 to 14, it says, uh, uh, the, he brings the firstborns into the world. He says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Let all the angels of God worship the Son. And here is a description of these angels. Are they not all ministering spirits? Ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Heirs of salvation. These are ministering spirits helping us to get to the final goal. The work of the angels is unmistakable, I said, as I said before, it, it leaves a mark, so we will not be able to doubt ever. Like uh, Apostle Paul, he saw a vision of Christ, and Satan could have come back and told him, look, that was not real. You know, that was a tired, you worked so hard that day, you know, late night, you were not supposed to travel, you, you were supposed to be sleeping, but you were on that horseback, driving on your way to Damascus. That was the wrong time. You should be on your bed. But you were too tired and exhausted, and so you got hallucination. You know, those kind of uh, arguments Satan puts to put doubts in our faith, you know, to undermine our faith. But he could not have under, undermined the blindness that happened. He was blind for three days. And that blindness, according to many scholars, lingered on. So there was a weakness in his eyes, continued to stay. So he could go back to that event and say, that was not hallucinations. The light was so bright, it left a permanent mark on my eyes and I can still see it. God does such things. He sends angels. Some of us I can't testify to that. I do not want to go into the details of some of this, but because, you know, this is doctrinally misleading. Angelology, as it is called. Angelology can be doctrinally misleading. We want to always ground ourselves on the Word of God and not these exterior supernatural experiences as the final thing in our lives. But suffice it to say, God intervenes in a supernatural way to help us. And here we have Jacob seeing the angels and he called it two camps, Mahanaim, two camps. So many wonderful things happened in the history, uh, uh, in the scriptures. If you try to follow the city, what actually happened, we have to leave it uh, at that uh, because of lack of time. But here is Jacob sending ahead a message to Esau that I'm coming. You know, I went away to get a wife for myself. It took me 20 years to get it all done. Now I'm coming home. Many people say the, the, the route that he was taking, the highway back to Canaan, you know, this is like about 3,000 miles, 5,000 kilometers. It takes several months to traverse that whole uh, journey uh, on that highway. He didn't have to get in touch with Esau because he's not in the way. Many people think 
And some people argue that actually it is uh, sufficiently close for him to understand there's some movement going on on the highway and he might come over. But regardless, Jacob is one who wants to tackle the problem head on. It's interesting. Now let us cross that bridge when we get there. You know, a lot of times people try to procrastinate and not deal with the issue, not deal with the problems. But here is Jacob dealing with the problem head on. Perhaps he was thinking, I do not want to be trapped in the land of Canaan when he comes and attacks me and I'm trapped. Perhaps that was his reasoning. We do not, we do not know. We do not, do not need to speculate beyond what is given to us in the scriptures. But he did actually send a message to Esau saying, I am coming back. I am coming home. And uh, let's see the message. He says, uh, Thy servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. When I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I am coming. I hope you're okay with that. You know, that's the kind of message he's saying. It's not as if he's, it's not as if he's boasting, look, I've got so much wealth. It is perhaps saying that I am coming and I really don't need to worry about this birthright. I don't have to worry about this inheritance. I've got a lot of it myself, but I, let us be in peace. That's the kind of message he's sending. And, and then he gets the message back from Esau, the threat of Esau, supposed threat of Esau. The servants who went to carry the message to Esau, they came back and said, your brother is coming to meet you. Your brother is coming to meet you. And by the way, he has 400 men with him. 400 men with him. Jacob heard that. And verse 7 says, He was greatly afraid and distressed. Greatly afraid and distressed. And there are about uh, four things that he does, or three things, three main things he does. First thing he does is to separate his company into two bands, two camps. You know, they, this is in, Jacob is in the habit of doing this frequently, trying to help God. Now God said there are two camps already, but he, he makes his own two camps of protection. You know, if this camp gets attacked, that camp will be saved. You know, he does not really realize that there's already two camps, one from God and one his. his. He doesn't have to help God. He tried to do that once. He's doing it again. Uh, but he is going to learn to trust more completely to on God. He will do that shortly. As God trains him up to grow to higher levels, he is able uh, to get to that point where he trusts him implicitly completely, wholeheartedly, uh, without a plan B. He right now has a plan B. If this happens, I can do this. Plan B. That plan B mentality needs to go away. If you have implicit faith in God, don't have a plan B. Only plan A. Well, so here, after he did what he wanted to do, his plan B, he comes to God. That's the second thing he does. Although that should have been the first thing. At least he's doing it. Better late than never, they say. But he's doing it almost instantaneously. Well, the same day he does it. He says, and this is a model prayer. And this is a good prayer that we all should model ourselves, our prayers upon. First thing he says is, Lord, verse 9, Oh, God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. He is recounting the promises of God. Recounting the promises of God. He's saying, God, you said so. You told me to do this, and I'm doing it. And you told me it's going to be well with me. He is actually recounting the verse in Psalm 31, verse 3. That return unto the land of thy fathers unto thy kindred and it will be I will be with thee I'm going to be with you you know this is uh, God's promise claiming God's promises is one of the ways we should model our prayers the word of God should be our prayer like Jesus always quoting scripture in our prayers 
the claiming the promise in our prayers very important because god is faithful to his promise god is truthful it says in uh, numbers 23 verse 19 god is not a man that he should he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent as he said and shall he not do it as he has he spoken and shall he not make it good yes that is god you can claim the promise of god you know when you know, a rich man gives you a check you need to uncash it you have no doubt in your mind that it's going to be uncashed right and somebody who is not such so well to do you might doubt whether this check can be uncashed or not but uh, the wealthy man when he gives you a check you are 100 percent sure almost certain that you can uncash that check and when you get a check from god you can be certain that it will be without fail realized and joshua says towards the end of his life towards the end of his life having seen all the wondrous things that god had done in his life he recounts the faithfulness of god and here's what he says in joshua 23 verse 14 joshua 23 verse 14 behold Yes. Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in your souls that no, that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not not one word of them has failed. Thank you. Not one thing has failed. Not one word has failed. Nothing has failed. This is Joshua at the end of his life, recounting the events of life, the words of God, and he's saying, not one word has failed of the promises that God has given. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, not one word will return unto me void, but will accomplish that which I please. God is saying that his promises will never, never fail. And that is what we should count on when we pray to God, God, you promised such and such, and I claim that promise in my life. You know, claim the promise of forgiveness, the promise of mercy, promises of his grace, promises of his providence, promises of his protection, of the many wonderful promises we can claim. Second uh, item in his prayer, characteristic of good prayer, is to confess our unworthiness. Confess our unworthiness. Here, he says in verse 10, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. And he goes back to his humble beginnings. He says, I came, I crossed this river Jabbok with my staff. All the possession I had was just a stick. That's all I had when I came into this land. Lord, now I have become two bands, he says. I passed over River Jordan with one stick, and Lord, I'm coming back to cross it in the other direction. Now I am so wealthy. You gave it to me. I'm not worthy of the least of the promises and the truth that you gave me. The promise of the Messiah that you gave me. I'm not worthy, Lord. It is great. We saw in our uh, worship time also about uh, what God does. Not because of what we have done. Uh, Second Timothy. Chapter 1. He says, Verse 9, he says, He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Not according to our works. No. He saved us not because of what we have done. No, it is because of His own purpose and grace. His own purpose and His own grace that He saved us. Confessing our unworthiness that we don't deserve the least of His mercies, is a wonderful characteristic of a powerful prayer, true prayer. And thirdly, 
he expressed his fears. He expressed his fear. He was honest. He told, Lord, I am afraid. This man, Esau, my brother, is coming after me. He'll probably kill me. Would you save me? Save me from this danger. It is good. Let your make requests made known unto God, it says. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. Let your request be made known unto God. Be explicit, be specific, and tell God what you're looking for. Answers. The answers will come when your prayers are specific. But he expressed fear. There are several reasons why he might be thinking. If he's coming with 400 people, that must be because he wants to kind of attack him and take his life. Because that's what was going on when he left 20 years ago. 20 years ago when he left, his mother came and told him, look, your brother is angry with you. He's probably going to take your life. And perhaps with the, in the clash between you two, I might choose both of you. I want to send you away. Go to this mother in my brother's place. And get a wife for yourself. And just be there. Stay there. And when, it is, when I realize that your brother's anger has subsided, he's no longer angry with you, I'll send a word for you. Then you come back in safety. He never got that word from his mother. He never got it. You know, his mother told him in Genesis chapter 23, verse 45, uh, he never got that word. And so he was, his reason to be worried that he's probably still, still angry. And secondly, because he cheated his brother of the blessings of the firstborn, he's not able to stand up to him. When Laban was chasing him, he was able to boldly withstand him because he was in the right. But when Esau comes, he is unable to do so. That guilty conscience pricks him that he cheated his brother. And if he's coming after him, he has no real, real uh, reason to withstand him with that moral authority. He didn't have that moral authority. But the fear that he has is needless. That fear is lack of faith. We talked about fear last time. About the example of Christ, who never showed fear while upon the earth. It says in Proverbs uh, somewhere, it says, the righteous is bold as a lion. Of course, we are not righteous on our own. Righteousness comes from Christ. And as we follow in his footsteps, we get that boldness. Righteous is bold as a lion, but also because God has promised and he saw the hand of God in his protection. Laban tells him, look, I wanted to attack you. I have the power to destroy you, but the God of your fathers told me not to harm you. Laban confessed the supernatural act that was going on behind the scenes to protect Laban. Laban should have, uh, Jacob should uh, protect Jacob, I mean. Jacob should not have any worry about it because he's seeing the hand of God and his protection all along. He did not have any reason to fear. He also saw the angels camping around him. You know, memories short. We look at the circumstances and we fear. We take the focus off. Of our, our, of Christ. Our eyes are not focused on Christ, but on the problem, and we are afraid. God tells us not to worry. In Matthew chapter 6, 32, he says, uh, uh, Do not uh, take no thought for your life, what you shall put, what you shall eat, and what you shall drink, not yet for your... Sorry, I'm misquoting it. Let's go there, Matthew 6, verse 32. It says, uh, after all yes. these things, Matthew 631. 631, may that give the context. Yes. Yes. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but the seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Thank you. Yes. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Sufficient unto the day is evil thereof. Worry about today, not tomorrow. Now, there's a psychologist did a survey, it seems. I don't know how they can do this survey, how you can measure it. But uh, they said 95% uh, of all the worries that we have, 95%. Never, never happened. Never, ever happened. Ninety-five percent. There's an interesting story about a man who was a uh, lot of credit debt. I'm sorry, a lot of credit card debt. So much so that he was behind on payments, and so they were going to come and repossess his car. He was behind on his car payments, so they were going to repossess his car. Not only his car, but he was behind on his mortgage payments too. So they were going to foreclose his home, so losing his car, losing his house. And he said to his friend, I'm not worried. I'm not worried. I said, why? I, I, I hired a professional warrior. Professional warrior. <laughs> I hired a professional warrior. Oh, you hired a professional warrior? <laughs> what do you pay to him? I pay him $50,000 a year. Oh, oh. You're already back on your payments and everything. How are you going to make that payment? It's not my worry. That's his worry. <laughs> <laughs> the professional warrior will worry about that. <laughs> you know, we have just had that uh, memory verse, First Peter 5, 7. Cast your burdens upon the Lord. We have a professional warrior. I'm not, I'm not saying that in a... Like, in a, in a have joking manner. I'm not joking. It is true. It's real. God is uh, going to take care of our problems. That's why he said in Matthew 6, 32, 33, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and I will worry for you. I will take care of all those other things that you need. I know you need all those things. It's my worry, not yours. That is what God is telling us. So we need to commit our lives to him and not worry about it. Here is Jacob. Last thing he said in his prayer is asking for deliverance. He asked for deliverance. So deliver me from my brother who is after me. Maybe he's going to destroy me and my wife and the children. Please deliver me. Finally, he recounted the blessings of Abraham, the covenant of God. He said, this is the covenant you made with Abraham, and that was passed down to me. And I claim this covenant. Matthew, in Genesis chapter 28, verse 15, he says, Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and I will bring thee again to this land. I will not leave thee and until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. That is a promise. As they recounted the Bethel experience, we heard uh, Praveen talk about that experience at Bethel. Beautiful experience. And it's recounting those promises, the, the covenant of Abraham. Then finally, his response after his plan B, after his prayer, he sends the last one. He sends a gift. To Esau in verses 13 through 18 we see we did not read it but we see that there that he gives a lot of uh, you know the cattle and servants and people uh, to go ahead and pacify his brother he's trying to pacify a gift given in secret pacifies the soul it says is that, that what it says in Proverbs 21, verse 14? Proverbs 21, verse 14. A gift in secret pacifies anger, and a bribe behind the back, strong wrath. Yes. Gift given in secret pacifies anger. And uh, a reward in the bosom strong wrath he says a reward and of course it is 
in the King James it says reward and in other translations it says bribe. A bribe is something that we don't as Christians uh, ever use as means to gain, uh, to achieve an end, an accompl uh, the accomplish an objective by resorting to bribes. Uh, this as Christians we should not engage in and uh, it is important that we stay faithful to the provisions of God and not the help of the devil. It's important that we don't do that. And here is Jacob trying to give a gift, uh, first of all, perhaps to pacify the anger, uh, not that he's going to bribe his brother uh, just to pacify him, but also to tell him, look, I don't need that inheritance for which I tried to cheat you. I tried to cheat you in the past, but I'm really not really interested. I don't really need all that. I have enough wealth. But he plans it in such a way that he will be the last one in the attack in case there is an attack. Everybody else would be actually <laughs> sacrificed before he faces Esau. That is how he planned it. The strange thing that we try to protect ourselves in spite of all the things that God is doing in our lives. We try to protect our skin many times. Jacob here is not acting in a heroic manner, in a sacrificial manner. He hasn't got to that point where he would face the first attack he was gonna be at the last. Very many times we sing this song, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. Sometimes we sing that song without really meaning it because we're trying to not surrender everything. We try to protect our skin. You know, I surrender all the goats here is saying, if that is not enough, I surrender all the sheep. If that is not enough, I surrender all the camels. And that's not enough, my servants, not enough, my children. And then finally, I'm there. You know, that's the last. We need to get out of that mindset. Important for us to, to be sacrificial in doing things right, in uh, having the mind of Christ, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That sacrifice that he made, uh, we need to get to that point where we are first in line of duty. First in line of duty. Uh, let us uh, remember, God is actually going to work in uh, Jacob's life to the point where he gets there. He's not there yet. In spite of all the supernatural experiences, in spite of the angelic intervention, in spite of the visions and uh, the, uh, the promises of the Messiah, he is still growing and he will grow to that point where he fights with God face to face. And that leaves an indelible mark on his body and we will come to that prayer of Jacob, the high point in Jacob's life and God willing the next time. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Lord, you have done, Lord, wonderful works. Lord, you send your angels into our lives. Lord, this, the promise in Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. Lord, you gave your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways on the right path. Lord, when we were straying, when we were going astray, we were falling into sin, Lord, you sent an angelic help to rescue us, to keep us on the right path. We thank you and we praise you. Lord, help us, Lord, to learn to be sacrificial. Lord, to learn to trust in your promises, to claim your promises, to depend on you, to not worry, not to fear, but to look up to you, to be strengthened. Help us, Lord, to be sacrificial. Lord, to mean the words of surrendering our all, living a sacrificial life, not being selfish. 
Lord, to be Christ-centered, other-centered, honoring you with our lives and fulfilling the purposes for which you have sent us into this world. Lord, for in Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Amen.